And uh, let's see, do our screen share. I have too many windows open trying to get the Zoom program to work. Let me close them. Okay, here we go. Now, screen share. Here we go. You should be looking at our um, website and we'll go the usual thing that we do here, go down to where the readings are. And here they are, the eighth Sunday after Pentecost. This one. Okay, here we go. So now um, what we wanna look at I don't like what this is doing. I'm going to stop for a moment and redo that. That. Uh, I got you want. Sure. That's better. Here we go. You should be looking at the screen. This is lectionary text for this Sunday. Is, is that what everybody has on their screen? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, good. Um, the other way, I couldn't see you. This way I can see you so I can see your response. Um, just a word, you know, normally we focus on the gospel lessons um, for the coming Sunday, but uh, the first lesson uh, last week um, and actually for the last two weeks and then this week um, are, oh no, last week actually, are a little odd to people's ears because they're from the prophet Hosea. Now there's the prophetic message of Hosea comes from a little different space than we're accustomed to. When we think of prophetic messages, we often think of someone like Amos from whom we had read for a few weeks prior to Hosea, where you've got this sort of fire and brimstone preacher kind of in the style of John the Baptist, you know, screaming at everybody and calling everybody names and, um, you know, getting everybody's attention. Uh, Hosea is a very different kind of prophetic message. It is, it is a, it, Hosea is a prophet who is using deep symbolism uh, in the prophecy that is being worked out. And in fact, it is a style of prophecy where actually it is in the living where the prophetic message is being transmitted. So you may recall the words from last week where um, as the readings were, were, were given, uh, it said, you know, take yourself a wife from whoredom. <laughs> you know, that's like, well, you know, we just don't hear those words in church uh, very often, but those are the words of the prophetic book. And the idea behind uh, Hosea's prophecy is likening Israel to an unfaithful wife. So that in fact, um, Gomer, who is the, the betrothed of Hosea and eventually marries him, and they have several children. The uh, whole imagery is that the marriage between Hosea and Gomer is representative of the covenant relationship between God and Israel. So that what we're talking about here is that essentially Israel is being called to account for being unfaithful and corrupting the covenant of God, which was the Torah. And so consequently, the, the, what we heard last week, for example, is the prophecy, the, not the, again the foretelling, although there's an element of that there, but the forth telling that the consequences of that action is that the northern tribes of Israel, which are called the kingdom of Israel, will come to naught. In other words, they'll just be destroyed. So that the idea, the, the core ethical idea behind this is that uh, decisions have consequences and that uh, God's mercy, while deep and broad, does not necessarily erase the consequences of the decisions we make. Um, usually what happens in particularly in prophetic uh, books is that the consequences in the writing are foretold 
but in fact, they are essentially theological reflections on things that have happened or are happening. So consequently, when we're talking about the infidelity of Israel, that's happening as Hosea is writing uh, or speaking this prophecy. And in fact, then the consequences, he has very little chance, really. No one person has much chance to change the course of history, particularly when we look at the history of Israel and we see the workings of God as using the nations of the world, the empires of the world, to work out those consequences. So once an invasion, for example, stops of un the unfaithful people Israel, simply repenting may not, in fact, change the course of history. That, in fact, you know, you've already sinned, and so you're going to pay the consequences of your actions and your decisions. So what we have instead often from the prophetic vision is an interpretation of for future generations as to how we need, for example, in this case, we need to be faithful to that covenant all the time, because when we stray from it, we may reap consequences that we do not want. So that's really the core message that we're hearing as we go through uh, this lesson from Hosea. But the, 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 uh, another element of the Hosea prophecy is the fact that this is a covenantal relationship, and that in fact, God simply does not wash his hands of Israel totally, and that there is mercy and there is grace in the future, should the people turn back to the covenant and be faithful to it. That doesn't mean that the nation will will remain, the nation, the kings, and you know, the whole uh, governmental superstructure, but they, do, they can find hope in God in the sense that they find their life patterns to be life-giving in and of themselves. So that there is fidelity. Once we, are, we, we regain fidelity to the covenant, um, it is not unfair or unmerciful of God to have us pay the consequences for our actions, but rather that there is hope for repentance and a change of life in the future. And in that change of life, then we will find, again, those are positive consequences. We will find a new way of living and a new way of life. To that end, from the historical perspective, that is in one sense and in one interpretation, the reason why God spares Judah, spares what's called the remnant of Israel, the, the southern tribes, and that the people of the north who now want to be faithful to God's covenant can return and go to Judah if they want and there live, uh, so that the God always, in a sense, opens a back door, opens an escape hatch for people. So that when we begin to understand this uh, God of the prophets, um, there is the, the continual arc that goes through them all. Um, Walter Brueggemann is great about this, uh, is to recall people to their original fidelity to the covenant. And it is the covenant which determines our life and should be determinative of our actions. And if we are faithful to the covenant, then the promises of God will be fulfilled in us. From a Christian point of view, when we read the prophets of the Old Testament, we need to look at not so much the covenant of the Torah, because we are no longer bound by that. We see that very clearly in Paul's work among the Gentiles, particularly his work in Galatians and later letters that we are no longer bound by the law. So we're no longer bound by the Torah. But at the same time, we are in fact uh, bound by our baptismal covenant. So that's kind of a, a little summary and then we'll get into that a little bit later, but that's sort of the summary of why all of we hear all of this language from Hosea. It's a beautiful book really, when you look at it. Um, there's a musical piece done by the monks of St. I think it's St. Meinrad's Abbey, Return to Me, uh, Return to Me, O oh Man. And it's, it's, um, it's, very it's a plaintiff kind of thing. Also, there's one by the St. Louis Jesuits, which dates from the 70s into the yeah, late 70s, early 80s. And uh, it's a great piece of music to meditate on. Uh, and if I had 
you know, forethought, I might have brought it up and 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 brought it up. We could listen to it because it's very brief. Um, we may do that at another time. But here, the gospel lesson for this Sunday, again, the way that the tracks that we're following in uh, the lectionary do not necessarily connect the lessons. So the less the the Old Testament lesson is not necessary, necessarily connected to the core of what is in the gospel lesson, which is not, this is track one that we're following at St. Luke's um, through this lectionary cycle. Uh, but beginning next year, we will then go to track one, which actually is a different, slightly different lectionary organization, which chooses Old Testament lessons to be supportive of and illustrative of the gospel lesson. So the two are related. In this track, we are doing continual readings from various portions of the Old Testament. And if they happen to relate to the gospel lesson, it's quite by happenstance. Uh, it's, it's not by design. So today uh, we have the gospel lesson from Luke, the 12th chapter, and it begins. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, friend, who sent me to be a judge or arbiter over you? And he said to them, take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And then he told him a parable. The land of a, rich, of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store all my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. So relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be then? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. Here ends the lesson. Amen. So, wow. <laughs> um, I can speak to that from an institutional point of view. The church, churches, for example, we can see them all over the place, where during a certain period of time when we might use the, the metaphor, the harvest was plenty, began building barns, um, you know, huge buildings, uh, education wings, schools. I'm speaking particularly from the Roman Catholic perspective, I can tell you that, that during the 50s, 60s, and into the 70s, I know back in my, in my home area, back in Western New York, that was the age, the golden age of buildings, of institutionalizing everything. And the Roman church was not alone in that. I know a lot of Lutheran churches that did the same. Many Methodist churches did the same. And so we have churches on every street corner and we have schools and education wings and these you know, massive buildings. And then when the harvest was poor, shall we say, that there were migrations from the center cities or the inner ring suburbs to the rural areas or to the outer ring suburbs, or as has happened in our society, there's been a decrease of commitment to church attendance and church programming from an institutional point of view. Suddenly we looked and we had these big barns. <laughs> and we, we don't know what to do with them. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, when we decide that maybe we've got too many of them and we need to pull them down, there is great hue and cry. So in one sense, that might be a modern version of this parable for Christians, for institutional oriented Christians, um, you know, where suddenly people bemoan the fact that we have to close parishes, close churches and sell off the buildings. But in reality, maybe we were a bit too proud 
And many times uh, in many denominations, I know this is true, particularly in the Roman church, buildings were built simply because we had disagreements. You know, you came from, in, in Buffalo, for example, you came from one part of Poland and you, you didn't really like the people from that other part of Poland. And so you built your own Catholic church, your own parochial school, your own parish hall, your own rectory, your own convent, all of this kind of thing. And then with the, with the passing of generations and the homogenization of these ethnic groups into wider society, suddenly they had all of these buildings and no one knew why. <laughs> and, <it> was, <laughs> and, and then the, the cost of maintaining them became the death knell for the communities themselves because it became all about survival rather than thriving within the gospel mission. So that the point when Jesus says, um, growing rich and abundant, essentially in the things of this world, and when we look at our church fabric, which is a good English term for buildings and things like that, that maybe we were too busy building all of these barns, these storehouses, and not becoming rich in the things of God. That we, fact, in fact, perhaps became less full in our barns, uh, in our buildings, because we had turned to them as a sign of our success and a sign of who we were in the world, rather than acknowledging that the whole purpose of it all, every bit of it, was the mission of God, which is to proclaim, as Jesus did, the kingdom of God and its values, and allow that mission, inspired within the Holy Spirit, to be transformative of not only our church communities, but our larger community. One of the things that you know, we have practiced at St. Luke's, at least in the time that I've been there, is a constant question, what is God calling us to do now in this place at this time? You know, that's a constant question brought to Vestry. Uh, annual meetings, we bring that question constantly, and periodically you hear it preached, that the notion that all of what we have all of the, the gold, in a sense, all of this, the great grain that we have in our buildings and so on, even as we start a new capital campaign, you know, here, you know, that, um, it may sound like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth with that. But the reality is, how is it ser in service to the mission? That is always the question that is the critical point. How is this in service to the mission? So for example, what we're doing in the church building, you know, God bless us. Thank you, George. You know, the lighting is nearly completed. The fans were going up on, let's see, today's uh, Thursday. I, they were just finishing installing the fans yesterday, which means they're starting to, you know, we're starting to close in on the last chapter of the installation <clears throat> uh, for our big celebration, a Sunday, a week from Sunday hence. And, um, but why? Just so that we who are there can see better? Or is the question really about, have we made our building more accessible to others hmm. and for other purposes other than our own worship? Before we began the capital campaign, for example, one of the things that's required for such a thing is to do a use a space use study. And that magnificent church building of ours, for example, is the least used space per square foot in the entire plant, and yet it is the biggest and most expensive. The space which is most used is the fellowship hall and the kitchen, followed closely by the auditorium. No surprise. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> that And so in terms of our project designs, we wanted to enhance the most used space. So that's why the fellowship hall is being renovated and the kitchen is being 
retooled as a com more commercial style kitchen and we're re reorienting it and all that sort of thing. And a lot of people said, well, why? We've got a perfectly functional kitchen. Well, no, it's not if you're going to change the focus of what we're doing and enhance the use of the space for future mission. And so that's the conversation that was had in the capital campaign committee. And then also when we went to the annual meeting and we had our you know, AI work with you know, what kind of uh, uh, projects do we want? What are the values behind them? If you notice that was a value oriented discussion, not just who's got a great idea about something. Uh, although that ended up being part of it, but it was to be governed by the values that emerged. And the value that emerged the arc was accessibility. Now that term often is a word of art and it's used periodically to focus on uh, physical accessibility from the point of view of those who are uh, abled differently relative to mobility. So ramps um, and uh, the uh, accessible restrooms, you know, things like that. But also when you stop to think about the lighting in the church, those of us who have decreasing powers of eyesight uh, will be aided by that. In the air conditioning in the church, for example, that's not a, that's not a done deal quite yet because we're still in that process of ferreting out and sorting out what projects we will do and what we can afford and so on. <clears throat> but if we do do the air conditioning, the purpose behind it wasn't simply to make us comfortable, although that's a benefit of it, but to allow the building to house events and, and, and invite people in who may not be able to breathe comfortably, for example, in a hot, humid, closed space. Um, we had, a, sim assist we had a, a symbol of that, if you will, God rest her, um, Marion Donaghy, um, a couple of years ago when her sister Betty Gates passed away. We have our funerals in the church in the middle of the summer, you know, because there's no option, other option, and it was a traditional funeral. So, you know, casket was there, all the whole thing, and, and um, it was so hot and so humid and so close, and she, uh, Marion, was suffering from COPD. And mm -hmm. in the middle of my sermon, I'm looking at her, and she's getting ashen. And then suddenly the head goes down and suddenly she's, I, I, you know, I'm not making fun of her at all, but these were the signs I was seeing as I'm trying to preach and do this. And she started to drool and I said, oh my God, she's having a heart attack or a stroke. And as it turned out, she was simply dehydrated and was having a difficult time breathing. And so she basically went into shock. Mm. And so of course, then the EMTs are there, you know, and so Betty's funeral was, her sister, there were two sisters left at that time, Joan Miller and M Manny Donaghy, and the whole thing, you know, became that and uh, all around that. And so then, you know, we were praying for her in the middle of the, of the, fu of the funeral for her sister. Uh, you know, we didn't want to have a double funeral right then and there. And then <laughs> um, we uh, got the uh, EMTs. And interesting, I was watching that all happen, which is another reason why we want I were doing some other accessibility issues. The EMTs were standing outside. They didn't know how to get into the church in a, in a way with the gurneys and all their equipment and everything because they were coming in the front door through the narthex. And we all know the construction of that church. The narthex is very small and there's a post right in the middle of it uh, because there are two doors on the front or the west entrance of the church. And so the way they needed to come in was through the tower door entrance, but nobody, somebody had to go out and tell them that. And also there was no, there's no ramp there. So bringing the gurney in becomes a, a thing of lifting up the gurney and all that sort of thing, which is even worse at the narthex because there's six steps to come up. So, you know, all of that was part of what went into, well, let's do something about the street level accessibility of our building as opposed to simply going in the back and using the elevator, which was the initial solution. And strangers like the EMTs don't know that that elevator is even there, much less is it usable. Um, and you know, guests to the, to the church don't, unless they really kind of look at our website carefully, don't know about the elevator. And 
the, the signage to send uh, mobility challenged folk to that parking lot is minimal at best. And so consequently, yeah, uh, unless you're looking for it, you don't see it. And it's in odd places uh, relative to, because of the one-way streets and all that sort of thing. Uh, people are afraid to go down a one-way street unless they know they're going to get out, <laughs> you know, those kinds of things. So um, there's a whole thing about putting it in the main entrance, the most obvious entrance to the church, and closing that, making it a vestibule, making it sort of a sub-narthex, if you will, and then having a ramp that will uh, allow people with such uh, challenges to come in and easily use the church. So all of that's a long story of how, you know, we have this marvelous building, which is very accessible, which is very expensive to maintain. And we could, and there are those who say, well, why don't we just, and, and here's, the, here's the rub. Why don't we just kind of make this an historical site, you know, get some grants or something and do that or turn it over to some historical society and build a church out in the suburbs. Mm -hmm. That was actually said to me since I've been there. And then the question becomes, what about our mission? You know, if it's just for us, fine. Our Moravian brothers and sisters did that. And interestingly enough, they're struggling to stay alive because their church is way out by where the CTC campus is, uh, you know, which is near the, the county prison you know, which is out by where the DMV is, those of you, you know, in the relative area with Home Depot and all that sort of thing. It, so it's way out there. And it's interesting because the Moravian mission is about evangelism. And if you're in the middle of nowhere, it's a little tough to evangelize, you know, where if you can uh, walk the streets of the city in an obvious way and do things that, that draw people then you have a different setting, a different situation. So maintaining our location is important. And there's another element to that, which is um, long studies have been done about this, that churches are community anchors. When the churches begin to leave, the neighborhoods begin to decline. Yeah. And part of that is because they are institutions. And they are obvious institutions. And so one of the challenges to remain a viable community is not only to have the church there, but to make sure it's in good repair, to make sure the grounds are well kept and so on. The <laughs> done by sacred places, Philadelphia <laughs> is the, the main place this come from, uh, is that you know when the, when the grounds are in good condition and the buildings are in good condition, it raises the level of the entire community that people tend to take better care of their properties and so on. When these large institutions, whether it's a school, the school grounds, our church, you know, Harding School, the parking lot, the playground, all of that needs to be neat, clean, kept up in good repair so that the others in the community see that this is still a thriving, viable place to live, work, and play. Yeah. I've, I've been well, one thing that comes to my mind to add to the pot is expectations. Um, in places where people do not expect a fancy church, but just a place to worship, they will be under a tree and be happy. Mm -hmm. But in our modern societies, uh, where people are expecting air conditioning, uh, proper temperature during the winter time, and beauty, and certain other facilities, it's very difficult to accommodate or invite people in. Mm -hmm. And and it's a, a the 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 challenge for the church is always how to invest in mission without oh, from, keeping in yeah, mind sorry. all those. Things uh, I remember, for example, um, in Cuba, I was in a church, what they call Casa Culto, which is really a house. And um, in, in Cuba, there was a time in which religion was persecuted and the pastors who left, um, left the, ch the building too, and the government took over the buildings. So what happened in this case was instead the Cubans began to use their own houses, like in old, 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 old times, 
to have their worship. And mm -hmm. I was in one of those in which there was only a very simple altar in what was, I assume at one point was the, um, the dining room area. Very simple form of a, a little altar. And then there were these tiny rooms empty and there were more people outside on the windows taking turns to look in that there were people in because this house was so small. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I was surprised. I would say that in that little house, I saw more people than in some congregations elsewhere. I, I would easily say more than a hundred people were around that little house mm -hmm. and they took turns. I mean, you look at the windows, the windows were full of little of, of faces of all colors and shapes looking in. And then you look 10 minutes later and there were new faces going in, looking in. <laughs> and there was this little, uh, this young woman, I would say seven or eight. And the pastor dared ask her to pray for the offering. And I said to myself, I would never ask an 80 year old to pray in front of all these people. Well, she put to shame many Christians <laughs> older than, I don't know, three times older than, because this eight year old stood in front of everybody and prayed something that I, I still remember with Oh. And then, but, but those were the expectations. A woman gave up his poor little house so that people will have a place to worship. Mm -hmm. And but if you try to do that in Lebanon, <laughs> you will have a hard time <laughs> <laughs> because people are not <laughs> expecting that kind of building. They, they <laughs> expect at least to be warm in the winter. <laughs> mm -hmm. The thing that came to my mind, um, why, why am I valuable? <laughs> Can I be heard? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. The thing that came to my mind was, uh, I'm thinking about the church that I attend and where I teach Sunday school. And um, it's this big steeple church in Anvil. That now has 40 or 50 people bravely holding forth on Sunday. And it isn't going to be too long before this little Israel's remnant group can't afford to keep this facility going. And I have seen it time and time again in the United Methodist Church that we have this huge edifice, the great big plant that Father David has described, and can and and the congregation has dwindled to the point where it's unsustainable and they'd rather stay in this beautiful place of their you know historical memory than do something different and what came to my mind is you know if I had six kids and we had this great big house and the kids have grown up and they've moved away and my spouse and I don't need all this space we have nobody would blink for us to downsize and I just wonder if somehow, I mean, I, I think that Father David said, he made a good comment about the, the witness of being in the location where you are, if you're seriously intending to and capable of being in mission in that place. Yes. There are plenty of churches where, I mean, I think Anvil is, is, is and I'm not trying to pick on them, but they're, they're <laughs> of a cautionary tale, I guess is that, you know, they're this beautiful house on the corner in front of LVC. Well, that's no mission. Right. That's, that's a descriptor of what that big building is over there. But it doesn't say anything about us, doesn't say anything about what we're doing, um, doesn't say if we're doing anything. It communicates pretty much nothing. Right, right. So, you know, I wonder if, there's a point at which the church needs to say, <clears throat> if we're going to be able to regroup and continue, then maybe we need to shuck off some of this excess stuff. Yeah. Yeah. 
and be in a place that's more manageable <laughs> if that place so so that the building is not what drags you down right but like, like you were saying yes. earlier when we can no I, long when when we as as a people can no longer sustain it uh well no let, let, let me let me say it differently when we as a people can no longer thrive within it that's the that's when the red flags need to go up. if we are no longer thriving but we turn our vision inward to survival uh -huh. thriving allows you to continually do mission now you know a lot of people for example and i think we've kind of turned the corner at st luke's on that a bit i think george you could you're the longest standing member here you could probably attest to that where in 2015, when I came as the interim, the finance committee was actually describing or debating what they would offer as a package for the person who would be the new call to the parish. And they were contemplating not calling a full-time priest because the money was tight. And in fact, uh, had you know, giving had declined, a number of other things are going on. And I sat in on that meeting and I was just dumbfounded, quite frankly. And I waited till the next meeting and we had a conversation then because the only problem that I saw after being there a little, even just a little bit was that the fundamental perspective was not about mission, it was about survival. And one of the things that I undertook as in my role as the interim was to try to shift that perspective a bit. And so that's why we did the appreciative inquiry work and all of that. And by the end of that year, we moved out of a deficit position into actually a surplus. And in fact, then, I mean, look, look at us now, that this is seven years ago, they were, they were wondering whether they could say, sustain a three quarter time priest. And now we have double that, we have one and a half. And it's all about that fundamental perspective. Uh, Diana, what comes to mind with me was an experience I had when I worked when I was still a Roman Catholic priest and I was the vice chancellor of the Diocese of Buffalo working in the bishop's office. Uh, I mentioned the big, 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 huge, you know, high steeple churches uh, in the city that were now pretty much decimated by suburban flight. There was this big German. Uh, ethnic church called St. Mary of Soros, immense building, you know, three times the size of St. Luke's, for example. A uh, big, you know, uh, Gothic, uh, you know, structure with flying buttresses and the whole nine yards, kind of cathedral-esque. And over the years, it, 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 it declined terribly. I mean, there was very little maintenance being done because they had no money to do it as people left. The congregation had dwindled. Now, by Roman terms, this is very, very small. By other terms, it's, it's well, why not? They had 100 families. But at one point, that, that church had over 2,000 families, which tells you, you know, because they were, it was the 19th century, you know, immigrants living all in, in the eastern uh, part of the city of Buffalo. Uh, you know, where you had people basically sleeping at home and working during the day and out in taverns and everything the rest of the time, uh, because there was no room to do anything at home because you were, you know, you were stuffing people into these small flats and, and townhouses. Or row houses, rather, they weren't townhouses. And, um, of course, all of that changed with the changing uh, demographics of society and so on and white flight in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Um, and to the point where the building became unsafe. We had, they no longer worshiped in the building. They hadn't worshiped in the building for years. They were worshiping in the old school auditorium and <clears throat> had turned that into a chapel. But now the exterior of the building was becoming unsafe. They actually cordoned off the sidewalks, you know, within, I don't know how many hundred feet of the building because large pieces of the facade would fall off. Mm. And um, basically the city, you know, called the bishop's office and said, you've got to do something about this. And, you know, we already were looking at it um, as things were, were happening. And the 
you know, had an engineering study and all that sort of stuff that you should do with it. And the to make it safe, not to make it pretty, but to make it safe would have cost $2.1 million. And the bishop said in a private meeting in which I was, he's now gone to God, so I can say this out loud. I can feed a lot of people for $2 million. We don't need that building. Uh -huh. That was never said in public be, in that way because they would have strung him up. But it was interesting, you know, once we went through the process of, you know, because there can, there's a canonical process you have to go through and uh, conversations that have to happen and all that sort of thing. People came out of the woodwork. How can you do this? How can, you know, my grand grandfather was married there and, you know, my, you know, the whole thing. Of course, they're living out in the burbs. They're not going to church at St. Mary of Sorrows. They're going to church at St. Philip's or, you know, St. Gregory the Great. Well, St. Gregory the Great, we used to joke as St. Gregory the Rich. You know, they're out there doing doing their things. And, but threatened to take the building down and they were all up in arms. Well, the building is still there, I'm happy to say. But what happened was they were so upset by this. The bishop said, I am not spending the church's money on this. The parish still exists. The, the congregation is still there. And it is still about the same size, 100 families, give or take. It's, it's in a predominantly African-American community now. And you know, so it's a very different ethnic makeup and so on. <clears throat> but they're there. But the church has been sold. And I'm happy to say to my alma mater. No, no, I'm sorry. Uh, it so was sold to a nonprofit that was formed by the, you know, all the people that complained that, you know, they were tearing the church down. They were able to raise money through grants and, and, and donations and all that to make it safe. And not only to do that, but then to renovate the interior where my alma mater, Houghton College, established an urban campus there. Um, and that's where their urban studies program was housed. Now, Houghton is 80 miles outside of Buffalo. So what they were looking for a, a, a city center kind of location. And so, you know, that therein is the answer to some of the problems that we face. That if when a congregation can no longer, when, when the building no longer sustains the mission of the congregation, the question should be asked, whose mission could be in there? And then it becomes, um, I think, reasonable and good to spend resources on it. Otherwise, we're like the, the pull it back to the lesson for today. We're like the man in the, in, in the gospel lesson. You know, our life is being required of us that clearly this congregation can no longer sustain this building. So now what are you going to do? You spent all this resource and everything, but for what purpose? So that one of the one of the things that, you know, Kathy, you've been on property committee, been on vestry, you were the junior warden. George, you know, you know, this stuff from your own experience as a warden and, and on vestry. Um, you know, what the reasoning but is behind the, the work that we do um, when the maintenance becomes prohibitive, that's again, that's a yellow flag that needs to go up. When we can't sustain the maintenance with our operating budget, then there's a problem. However, it doesn't mean that all work needs to be done from the operating budget. We're talking maintenance, keeping the thing safe, you know, sealed from the weather, you know, those kinds of things. The kinds of things that we're planning to do coming forward are, are a whole different category. That's why it's called capital improvements. And capital improvements must always done looking, be done looking toward the future. And if a church is looking to the future, the question becomes, what is our mission going to look like in five, 10 or 15 years? And are we doing this work in order to enhance that mission, either current or future mission? And then how are we going to do that? So that, you know, it may sound like we're just sort of pulling down our barns and building more barns for us by putting air conditioning in the church, but the church is in, in a, the least used piece of building in, in our plant is not, was for years not even used during July and August. We would go to the auditorium to worship because we could be comfortable there. Um, now that it's COVID time, you know, we're still in it, although we hope at the tail end of that, 
just the sheer volume of air in the building is important. And part of what we're looking at with the air conditioning system is a filtration system. That even when COVID is gone, um, you know, cold and flu season comes along, it, you know, uh, there's a UV uh, system that we can include in the air exchanging that in fact uh, might make it even safer to be in that building than any other enclosed space in the plant. It yes. also helps with allergies. Yes. We, we have one at home. We have one at home. Yeah, yeah. We just installed one in our house because we discovered we were getting mold buildup in our ventilation system. Right, good. And this takes care of that. It'll even clean up what's already there over time. So we, I asked the our tech if you know we needed to get them clean, and he said no. Give it about a year or two, you know, and, and with constant use, it'll actually clean itself from all of that stuff. Um, you know, go ahead, George. I've lived long enough that I've seen every combination and permutation of what we're talking about, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I have seen uh, things that looked hopeless uh, blossom. Mm -hmm. I've seen incredible congregations with more money than they knew what to do with struggling. Uh, we've in Lebanon, we've got a dozen stories we we could we could uh, quote, but there is one that comes to my mind. We would go every summer to a summer home in in, in Michigan on Lake on the shoreline, and there was a mission Episcopal church down the road, a, a rather tiny place, might seat fifty people, uh, and in the winter time almost empty. Summertime, uh, guys like uh, Betty and me would come, and we we'd kind of kind of fill this little space up. And every one year or two, they were looking for a new priest who could work there part-time. Uh, it volunteer retired police, uh, priest kept it going. And this went on and on. And then I got a letter from them stating that they were getting a new priest. And then it said she, now that was a change, and uh, would be working full time. And uh, this woman transformed that place so that you couldn't find stand up room in it in the summertime. Uh, she was a person that remembered everybody's name. Uh, Betty and I'd come in there, she'd throw her arms around us. And they wound up uh, building, the, using that church as an office and building a beautiful church next to it, and which uh, is thriving. And there was something in her that transformed uh, that whole situation. And uh, she was a pretty unconventional person, but uh, the, everybody loved her. And she, she, she just had one uh, inspiration after another that turned people on. And so that uh, the mission of the church changed uh, much for the better. Uh, and so that I think churches like ours that have, that have lived all this long find their needs of the community are changing around them, but often they don't change. And so that the, the message here is, uh, do we really know what our mission is? What is happening around us? What have what are we offering that nobody wants? Uh, and, and I'm not saying that there are any easy answers to that, but I've seen it happen in my lifetime. Yep, yep, yep. I, I, you're, you're, you're spot on with that observation, George. That's exactly the case. 
Um, and in fact, uh, that's one of the things that, um, you know, it's pretty well set that I'm going to be on sabbatical from mid-April to mid-July in 2023. <clears throat> so that um, I actually was on the phone in conversation with uh, Robin Zoke, uh, who will be the priest who will be taking my place, not as rector, but as a supply priest and as an advisor during my absence. And um, the vestry uh, asked me to find somebody who could do it instead of just getting supply priests every week, you know, for, for liturgies uh, to actually have someone who would be guiding and advising the community. She's now doing this at St. Andrews in Shippensburg. So she's got to, she's getting, she just recently retired. She was the Dean at the Stevenson School for Ministry. And she's, so she's getting kind of her, her bearings as how this is gonna work uh, from a systematic and sy systems point of view. Uh, the, the two of us, talk systems talk all the time. So that, that's why we're, I asked her to come. And one of the things we were talking about yesterday is just that, like we, we're, we're kind of, we've reached sort of a turning point now, I think at St. Luke's uh, and COVID was the uh, sort of catalyst that has enabled us really to start rethinking some of the things that we're doing. And as we reemerge, not simply to restore what was, but really to begin to look what, to what can be in the future. And so what I'm hoping is that during that time with her expertise and her background, uh, that will be a time for visioning and revisioning in the parish. Uh, by then we'll be pretty much have the capital campaign in hand, whether it's finished or not, it's another issue. And the project certainly won't be done, but at least there will be something also to think, okay, we're doing this now, you know, what, what, what creative ways can we begin to re re-envision what our community is and what our mission is in the neighborhood, within the city and within the county, you know, never forgetting that, you know, our parish from a traditional sense of parish is the entire county of Lebanon, um, which then turns me to another uh, element, which kind of was, I was reminded in Carmen's comments about the house church. One of the things in our vision 2020 was to create um, little, little communities within the population centers throughout the county where people would be able to gather for whatever purposes that they felt that they wanted to gather, you know, who were parishioners um, and, you know, invite others who were not parishioners to gather with them, whether it's to have a periodic dinner, to have Bible studies, to have uh, discussion groups, book reads, you know, whatever people decided they wanted to do in those discrete communities, you know, one in Anvil Cleona, one in Myerstown, one in Jonestown, one in um, you know, Schaeferstown, perhaps, if there are enough people. You need a critical mass maybe of you know, five to 10 people. Um, and the Episcopal Church has a long history of doing this in a different context. Um, when the parish that I was in in Buffalo, St. John's Grace, used to have what, was called, what were called salt shaker dinners. And basically, everybody gathered for a big dinner at church, and then everybody was split up into these little groups. And in those little groups, you, you basically went to each other's homes for dinner. Um, and then you could ask a you know, speaker, maybe the clergy or somebody else to come and share dinner with you and then offer some insights and, and that sort of thing. You could meet for prayer. Some people did uh, evening prayer together or Compline when dinner concluded. Um, so there were various things that were done. And it's a great way of building the community outside of the central location but it doesn't make the central location meaningless what it means is that that presence in that in in the community has a tie to all of the other presences in the community and so you don't have to come to lebanon to be part of church you can be in your neighbor's house you know uh, so that's uh, th those are pieces of it so that those who do not like the big building and all the formal, you know, vestments and all the hoo-ha and the choir, and the procession can still experience Christian community and prayer and fellowship outside of that reality. Because there are people who just simply are not comfortable. Um, that's one reason our five o'clock service is so valued. It, you know, at its height, it's been maybe 23, 24 people. And that's almost too big for the way we do it. It's usually between 12 and 16 people, 17 people. And part of that is a couple of people who come regularly go to no other service because they're just not comfortable in those other services. 
or they have a family situation that doesn't permit them to go to the other services because they need to be caring for somebody, you know, getting them up and out and, you know, doing that sort of thing on a Sunday morning. So offering these various um, ways of having fellowship and community using the resources that we have collectively, but then also using the other resources that we have, the barns sort of that already exist outside of the big barn, <laughs> if you will, um, as well as, again, enhancing and moving outside of the building. In Celtic spirituality, in Celtic evangelization, um, and this is, there. St. Luke says the symbolism for this as well. The monks in the various monasteries used to go out and live with the people in the countryside. And then when danger encroached, when there was an invasion of the, you know, the Norsemen or something, they would gather everybody and they would run to the safety of the monastery within the monastery walls. That's the origin of that fence that we have around the church. It, in, in, in England, that's called the parish close. And the idea is that you can close the gates against the hordes coming in. Now, it's merely a fence here. It's not going to keep any marauding you know, mobs out of the church. But the, the symbolism behind mm -hmm. that is that the plant itself within the parish close needs to be understood and seen as a safe space for people. That's where people can run for peace and for safety, whether it's from the pressures of hunger, homelessness, um, bullying because of one's identity, racial or sexual orientation or social class, whatever. And the fact that the Episcopal Church in the Anglican spirit is a church for all, inclusive, where the message is God's love you full stop, no conditions. That that is the message we need to send. So this, those massive walls and oak doors and all that sort of thing. It is one of the most difficult parts of my job is to, is I'm finally succeeding, uh, is to get the ushers to keep the doors open during services. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let people see what we do. You know, when they hear all that noise that they can see what we're doing, they can stop and cut. And from the altar, I have seen that people will kind of stop and they've never actually seen. I'm amazed at the number of people in Lebanon, in the Lebanon community that have never been in that building. And that building has been there for over 150 years. I, I think that part of what I have experienced not coming from Tennessee to Pennsylvania, there's a the challenge when you're new and you're not familiar with some of the traditions of a particular church. It's very common for you to feel fear the first time you try to get in, especially if you don't know anybody. Um, I have seen several members of the congregation, like Thun, that will come up to someone they recognize as new or they have not identified the faith before and talk to them. But I can imagine that just like me, there will be people in the community that are curious, even interested, but they don't know anybody. Right. And they say, what do they do there? Well, am I supposed to dress a particular way? At what time do I come in? And I see them standing and then sitting and then kneeling and then going out and then going up and then coming back. And what are they doing? And these are things that are part of who we are and we're familiar because in my case, I grew up as a member of a congregation of a different kind, but I was familiar with some of the traditions and um, but for a stranger who never goes to church or has grown in a family that has never attended any kind of faith community, it must be overwhelming, yeah, yeah. strange, but in a small group, 
or if we have other kinds of connections, that person may be interested in coming and trying. Well, therein is an, a, another element that we really need to continue to develop relative to the mission of the church to make the barn useful, to fill the barn, uh, is hospitality. When you say the word hospitality in our context, it usually means somebody who's going to host coffee hour and you know the, bring the cookies and make the coffee and that sort of thing. But a, a, a ministry of hospitality is about the very thing you're talking about, Carmen. It is to welcome the stranger, which is part of our mission um, in terms of the spiritual and corporal works of mercy, is to, you know, that we welcome the stranger, the pilgrim, as it were. And there, maybe nobody's on a physical pilgrimage, like if you were on you know, the, the Camino, but the reality is that everyone is on a spiritual pilgrimage through life. And so when someone shows interest, our task is to welcome, not to overwhelm. And that's where the balance has to be you know, struck um, because we, we can all descend on the visitor you know, and literally frighten them away. But here's a question that I would pose. I posed this to Vestry and it just kind of fell flat because we weren't ready for that conversation. But this year at the LGBT uh, pride event in, in um, uh, Lebanon, we had a booth, which was great. And it was very interesting to see people, you know, cause we had, uh, see, I was there, Mother Mary was there, Steve Doster was there and a couple of the kids were there. Um, who identify LGBT, and we were all, you know, very happy. And 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 Steve, Steve's work, he's a lobbyist uh, for an educational nonprofit, and he knows how to work a crowd, and he knows how to, you know, do that. So he was great about reaching out to people, reaching out to people, and. Um, you know, giving them a brochure, talking to them, engaging them a little bit. But I was amazed at the number of people when he was either busy with somebody or wasn't there. And neither one, Mary, Mother Mary and I were actually talking to anybody at the point, at that point in time, where people would sort of stop. They would look, they would I'd see, you know, our poster and our brochure, and they would very furtively come up to the table because we had little um, uh, bling. We had, you know, stickers and all that kind of stuff, the giveaways that you do with those things. And they would say, can I take one of these? Absolutely. You know, and it, it, they said, God loves you. Uh, and it, you know, it, it said it in both Spanish and in English. And we would be able to engage people then in conversation. And when we did, it was interesting because they, what I heard more often than not was people didn't even trust that message. Because other churches say that all the time. But there's an ellipsis after that. There are three dots. God loves you, dot, dot, dot. That's why we want you to change. <laughs> that's why you can come here and we'll help you cure or, you know, whatever. And, you know, that's why when I say that God loves you, full stop, no conditions. That's a different message. And there were people that even when you said that to them, they really didn't still believe it. And, but the interesting thing too was at the festival, of the people we spoke to, I would say 70 to 80% were people who had tattoos, earrings, I don't mean just earrings, but ear, you know, an ear full of rings, nose rings, piercings of all kinds, strange goth hairdos, all that sort of thing. And what I brought to the vestry was this. I said, we were out there inviting all these people to come to church. What would you do if one of them walked in? <laughs> you know, what would you do? Would you be afraid of them? Would you wonder what the hell are they doing here? Um, or would it be like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad to hear, but I haven't got a clue of how to approach them because we're unsure and insecure about ourselves. So that training in the ministry of hospitality is how to overcome those barriers. Whether it's even someone who has a physical disability, which is a little out of the ordinary. You know, someone who has, uh, you know, 
for example, has had horrific cancer surgery where part of their face is missing or something like that. I mean, such folks often are afraid to come into groups or, or communities because they don't want to become the center of attention. So how do we incorporate folks like that in any meeting that we have, not just worship, but perhaps, um, you know, our feeding ministries or anything like that, you know, when somebody comes in. And, you know, we do have a few folks around who've had, you know, some physical, you know, um, medical issues where filters are not quite as good as they should be and sometimes say things aloud that they're thinking, <laughs> you know, and the question is, do they belong at the welcome desk when that that's the kind of people that might be coming in, you know, those kinds of things. Um, and so, you know, putting people in the right place is also part of our ministry as 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 leadership. Well, so but finding the gifts and calling them forward is really the key. Diana. I, I'm wondering if one of the greatest barriers for a ministry of hospitality is familiarity and, complac and complacency. Uh, you know, I think mature adults kind of know how to ri rise above. And if you see someone who has some significant differences in appearance, whatever they are, I mean, we've been taught not to stare and, you know, people know how to be polite. Mm -hmm. But I can say from my own experience in the number of times that I have been to the eight o'clock mass, how few people actually ever bother to say anything to me. Yep. I know almost no names. Right. And I mean, it's, it's not like... I have to stand back and wait like some little Miss Pris for somebody to engage me. <laughs> but um, it would be nice. <laughs> yeah. um, I know when we were went to Anvil, we were studiously ignored for a few weeks. And um, I finally thought, well, okay, fine. I'm going to sign up to be a scripture reader. My name will be in the bulletin. I will be in the front of the congregation. I have to notice me now. Um, but it was really only when we got involved in the Sunday school class. It was a small group, it's more intimate, there's more time to talk, and it's, it's a place that's perhaps more conducive. Then we got to know people, and they're lovely, of course. Uh, but I think folks need that constant reminder to say, speak to people in addition to the ones you know yeah. Yeah. well. I, I think part, this is part of the recovery that we still have to undergo from COVID. Oh, and it's not just St. Louis. I mean, this is every church. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but our coffee hours traditionally were good places for people to have those conversations. And part of it is the sort of small C Catholic spirituality, liturgical spirituality, that church is a place to go and be quiet and reflect and think. Um, even the signs of peace. I used to joke uh, when we'd say, you know, give to one another a sign of peace. It would go on for three or four or five minutes sometimes, even at the eight o'clock service, because people, since they sit so far apart, they'd have to walk around the whole church. But because of COVID, all of that was put away. And then on top of that, we put the coffee hour away. And now you know, we still have to be somewhat careful about all of that, but I think people are starting to break down a little bit, break some of those barriers down. And I'm hoping that we can soon, maybe September, October, return to the coffee hours. We're trying to figure out how to configure that at the moment. So uh, soon, you had a comment. You're, you're muted. Soon, you're muted. Um, the comment about the piece, I. I mean, I'm sort of under the impression that that was frowned upon because it was so disruptive to the continuation of the service. But it is a chance to speak to someone in the congregation who is visiting and say, you know, can you come to the coffee hour? Or, hello, I'm glad you're here. I mean, I can think of, and it, <laughs> there's so much support there needs to be more sensitivity in people who are members of the church to support um, people who are new. And also, I mean, I can think of a, a trans 
young trans woman who came for a few weeks. The eight o'clock, yeah. And there was not much help for her. There was a poor man who clearly had PTSD who was involved with the, um, the VA. <sighs> and uh, Brian, Brian um, Weaver, among other people, he was all over this man trying to help him and make him feel more welcome. Um, but again, they, they sort of drift off and it may be that our church isn't the right place for some of these people. Um, but I, I mean, I don't think we're good at welcoming people. And I do think that possibly the peace thing should be liberated a little bit. Well, we're, we're, we're moving toward that. I, you know, I, I'm just a little nervous still about COVID, you know. Yeah, um, well, I hear that. And I mean, even the fact that we've restored communion the way we have, I brought that up at a meeting I was at and I was practically drummed out of the room um, because, you know, because we do it by intinction. Um, I mean, nobody still does it by, you know, at this point by sharing the common cup, but even intinction was thought to be, you know, you're taking a risk, you know, kind of thing. I said, no, I've done the science. I've looked at the work and, you know, that's probably the le the safest way of doing it at this point in time and, and still sharing both elements, which is a very big part of our tradition. And I think people, it was interesting because I got a number of comments once we restored it from just under one kind, how people said, I didn't realize how much I missed it until suddenly, yeah. you know, I had that taste in my mouth again, you know, and, we are a sacramental church. And so those things become, you know, imbued in us and they are terribly, terribly important. Um, that's also true relative to hospitality. Uh, so, I mean, doing the coffee hour is the sort of second chapter to the sign of peace. Like you said, soon you want to invite people, but when there's nothing to invite them to, you know, it, it's, it's a little hard. So we're working on, you know, when we come back in some sense of uh, new, you know, the seasonal year, September, we always think about school years and so on, that we might, after vacations and that, begin to to do that. We might inaugurate it with St. Luke's Day, you know, that that's sort of our big hurrah in, in the fall. Um, on the other hand, Mary and I were talking about having a rally day, um, you know, our, our old uh, Come Back to Church Sunday or Welcome Back Sunday or whatever we called it for a long time, um, but do it around Christian formation. And in fact, um, actually talk about we talked yesterday about having a ministry fair as we did with one of the stewardship pr programs i did when i first came i said i still have those signs and things we have to dig all that out um you know to demonstrate to people what they can get involved in in the church um you know that a lot of people have don't know even what we're doing anymore because of covid you know everything was shut down and is that back yet things have changed for example uh, what was hopes and is now fresh start. The homeless shelter is no longer being housed. And LCCM just made the decision at their last board meeting that it will permanently now be at the Chestnut Street Community Center. So we're, uh, and I had a chat with Mary and um, with a couple of other people about how can we reinvigorate St. Luke's participation in that. It was easier to do that when it was in our house because you know we had to do it. Um, now it's in somebody else's house and what they need is staffing. But even I have to go and talk to uh, the powers that be over there because even that's changed. They don't offer the hospitality and things that we used to offer. And somebody came up to Mary because she goes there usually once a week or so and said, I wish you people would keep would do it again. In other words, in their church, because St. Luke's was so hospitable to people. I mean, in the sense that they provided snacks and uh, fellowship and all kinds of things that many other churches didn't do, and they're certainly not doing over at the community center. And, so and, there's going to be a, some conversation around how we can revive that um, and maybe get involved on a more regular basis, and then maybe have our two weeks that we always did before. So I'm going to talk with Jen um, and some other folks and see what we can do with that. And this is sort of part of what is <laughs> torn power packs apart. Mm -hmm. We've lost mm -hmm. our, our connection with the families. We're packing boxes and that's fine, but we have no connection with the families which we had before, right. which is sad, but I mean, mm -hmm. the work has to get done so we can do it, but. 
Right. Well, it becomes a question. I'm reading in a very interesting book. Um, but we've really gone off track here. Um, I'm a really interesting book. It, I don't have it with me now. It's in the car. Uh, but it's a study about food banks in England. And the question is, uh, I think the title of, of the um, book is Bread in Broken Britain. Um, and it's a, an analysis from a theological point of view as to asking some critical questions. For example, is simply giving out food or food vouchers and that sort of thing, kind of like what we currently do, is that really just being supportive of a broken social service system? Mm. In other words, we're plugging holes. Yeah. Mm. Particularly when there's no advocacy element to what we're doing. Right. So the advocacy element becomes important. But also just what you mentioned, because a lot of the anecdotal uh, stories that are told throughout this is how it wasn't so much what they got when they came from, uh, from a physical point of view, it was what they got from an emotional and personal point of view right. is that they found community, they found fellowship, they found support, they found a remedy for their uh, just a, you know, a bit sort of a, a salve for their loneliness. Um, and when those elements are not part of the program that all we're concerned about is putting food in people's mouths, for example, uh, in this, this analysis, you know, are we really doing what the Christian gospel calls us to do or are we simply complicit with the agribusiness system, the supermarket system, the retail consumerism of our country and our societies? Now, this is about Britain, to be sure, but there, there are examples drawn from studies that were done in the United States as well, and they're instructive. And I think that's something that we need to have a, a rather heavy conversation about, yeah. uh, both in our parish and also with LCCM. Well, Fox Toxic charity is another good title for that. Ah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because but, you know, are, are are we making people dependent on that? And right. and I don't mean from a like conservative political point of view. You know, the welfare queen kind of uh, you know language, but rather that we're actually relegating them to a permanent second class citizen status because we're not really supporting their dignity. We're just simply supporting their hunger and giving them just enough to survive to be hungry some more. And, and I, as the conversation has evolved, I see that we have come to more of a mission view or a view of buildings and institutions. But the basic question that comes back to me is how do I invest myself and my resources, my capacities in something that is meaningful now and can be built for the future. Right. For the churches, it has been for too long how to build better church, better buildings, better infrastructures, better, more beautiful locations. But maybe the challenge for us now is how can we invest in people seeing that these people are in more need than ever? Right. Seeing Absolutely. that there are some social changes that people do not understand and have become divisions and have become violence against each other and have become uh, suspicion. And how can we invest ourselves in creating conditions that help people develop a more loving, patient, significant yes. relationship among our differences, even I, when I, we're different. I, I had a homiletics professor my first year seminary who, when, when someone would say something, was like, I'm glad you asked that. So I'm <laughs> glad you said that, Carmen, because... <laughs> One of the things that is now sort of in its nascent stage of discussion development is the possibility of St. Luke's entering into a program from the Episcopal Church. Um, and it's not a top-down thing. It's actually a very good program that is a grassroots building program called Sacred Ground. And its focus is primarily racial and ethnic reconciliation 
but it begins with common reflection in small groups where people sit down and talk to each other. And um, it can be done on a parish basis, but one of the things we're thinking about doing is opening it up. Um, actually, one of our neighboring, I'm going to talk to the, rec, the uh, priest in charge at one of our neighboring parishes over at Mount Hope, uh, Hope Church, because we've been working together trying to get some sort of collaborative stuff going there because they're a tiny little church. Um, and also some of the churches in the Lebanon community and how's a this programming over at the chat I got to talk to Dave and Laurie Funk yet about housing it over across the street so that it isn't just St. Luke's you know type thing and that it's a community-wide thing and inviting other members of the community into these conversations and that's how we can begin to um as I, and, and, and the people of St. Luke's have heard me say this all the time. Our kingdom work isn't to build up our church. It's not to increase our attendance in the building. It's to make an impact of the kingdom of God in our community. Mm -hmm. That we must always keep that outward focus. And when we keep that outward focus, we will thrive because that work is always at the ready to be done. And there will always be people willing to participate in that work if it's clear that they have the opportunity to do that. Uh, especially young people. This is, a, this is an area where we can involve young families and young, uh, young adults. This is where they're at. Um, this is not, you know, from all the <clears throat> studies that have been done by Barna and <clears throat> uh, some of these other groups, Pew, uh, young people are not interested in sitting in pews and worshiping on Sundays if that's all you do. However, they may be interested in joining in that if you are all together finding relationships outside of that. So it's, it's the other way around. You don't come to church and then get involved. You get involved and then maybe you come to church. Mm -hmm. And that is the model of acts. You know, isn't that, you know, the, the, that sort of campfire song that, and they'll know we are Christians by our love. That's the witness that we give. And love is based on justice. And so if we're doing the works of justice and mercy, then in fact, we will end up doing the works of love eventually. Is there any way we could fit that into the service some Sunday? Yeah. That uh -huh. song. That oh, that song. I well. <laughs> <laughs> um, that that will be a challenge. I can say that. Yeah. Um, I, I, <laughs> kind of loses something on the organ. Yeah. yeah uh, well, yeah. And, and in that space, uh, we kind of do that kind of stuff on the Saturday service. But um, one of the things, actually. Um, that was one of the things I, I want to just return to the hospitality issue that our problems with hospitality at St. Luke's church are not only to the outsider, they are also to the insider. Uh -huh. One of the comments on the worship and music program uh, survey that came through was somebody who said, I have been a part of this church for 70 years, my whole life. And I think I have a good idea who this might be just from the various comments that were made. They said, I have been in church where no one will talk to me. And at coffee hour, well, I'll be sitting and no one will approach me. Now, this is a member of the church, long standing. Because we as humans have a tendency to go to our little cliques and our little groups. Mm -hmm. And when people are maybe, and in this particular case, I think the person is highly introverted. So they're not going to move out to someone else. They're, and it's not that they think they're anything special, that someone should come to them. It's just that they find that very difficult. And so that, that's the kind of awareness that we need to train people up in. Mm -hmm. And not just the official ministers of hospitality, they could be the catalysts, but that we all begin to understand how these things work. That, yeah, hospitality by definition is everybody's job. Like pastoral care, you know, to go there, yeah. George. By the way, that wasn't me because I've only been here 50 years. <laughs> And, and, and George, I've never known you to be a wallflower. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. Well, it's 1130. Um, I know we went far afield from a Bible study, from a, a technical study of the scripture. But I think many of the things we discussed in here were actually implied in this parable. And that, for, you know, to, to put a fine point on it, that's the point of parables, is that we begin to see ourselves in the story 
and that the teaching that Jesus tries to use the parable to accomplish becomes part of our constant discussion. So it's about the value orientation and the value centric element of the parable, which in this case is about selfishness or self-centeredness. And many of the things we talked about, um, you know, the very purpose of why we have buildings, is it for us or for others? Um, in terms of our uh, accessibility philosophy, is it about just because we, some of our people need that or because we want to open this up to other people in the community for other events and, you know, and to have them come and join us in various ways of doing things. Our outreach discussions that we had, that was all a piece of that as well. Why do we have store storehouses for grain except to share that grain out to others, not to pad our own futures? Um, you know, so the, there's a lot that we talked about that is actually explicative and instructive of Jesus' parable today. So this wasn't just a, a you know, sort of, uh, I forgot the word, but you go, all, go off on a different tangent and you never come back to the point. I think we were really spot on with the conversations we were having. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, this has had an impact on us. So as I said, I'm grateful that you were here today. Just a reminder, we will not have Bible study for the next two weeks. Um, for those of you who uh, came in just a few minutes after we started, I'm going to be, at least hopefully, at my 45th college reunion next week. And I'll be traveling Thursday morning. And um, then the following week is my August vacation. So I'll be, excuse me, I'll be out. So um, we will not meet until the 18th of August. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank in the meantime, you. you guys can come together too. You know, you can you can have a Bible study <laughs> on your own. Okay, folks, have a good week. I, I would volunteer, but I will be writing papers for the next week. Okay, there you go. All right, uh, and don't forget that next this coming Sunday we're in the auditorium, and then the big reveal is the week following. You will be gobsmacked by it. Honest to God, I mean, it is such. A different thing and we have George to thank for it and we will be paying special tribute to his late wife Betty who was taken from us very suddenly at the beginning of the COVID shutdown um, you know from a from a stroke and um, we you know very suddenly uh, and we will pay honor for her because uh, George I do have that right you know she toward the end of her life she was having difficulty seeing she had many problems. Yeah, and so this is a fitting tribute to her legacy. Yeah, that... but the blindness uh, was with her progressive over several years. Mm -hmm. And I had been spoiled by singing in the choir for 35 years where the lighting was wonderful. And when I came down there and I would help her perhaps read parts of the leaflet tour, I found I couldn't, could hardly see anything down there. And that's when I started making complaints. <laughs> well, to give you an indicator, Steve Doster, our senior warden, happened to be there one day when they were working and all the lights were on. And he said to me, you know how we've talked about having our own cups, having racks of cups, you know, so we don't use phone cups and so on in our push toward our carbon footprint um, for coffee hour and so on. Uh, we started that just before we shut down. Uh, that we're now going to have a rack for sunglasses. Um, <laughs> so fortunately, we can now dim the lights as well. Uh, and George, one little in, indicate, uh, I was there with the technicians the other day, they now can, they're going to install a module that we can dim the globes, they won't be so bright. Oh, all right. So <laughs> they're too they were, bright now. Yeah, they were either on, <laughs> they were either on or off. And they said, well, now we, we actually the manufacturer told us we do have now a module that we can put in. And they were saying, well, I don't know if you want to do that. I said, well, how much is it? And they said, well, they're $150 a piece. I said, I'm all for it. Yeah, yeah. So am I. I said, I'll pay for it if I have to, you know, just, <laughs> just do it. So uh, the entire thing is going to be a marvel. So we'll have a little demonstration of how it all works. And, Are they replacing all five fans? Yes, and they're done. Oh, good. 
they're done. And they're on uh, remote controls so that we can vary the speed and also the direction. So they will be much more helpful in terms of the environment. All right, folks, we'll see you um, in church or in the auditorium maybe on uh, Sunday possibly. And then on the Sunday following when we do the memorial for Betty and the dedication, uh, there's only one service, it's at 10 o'clock in the morning. So uh, we'll, we'll see you in church then. Take care. Bye-bye.